I'm joined today by Dr. John Toussaint. John is the former CEO of the ThetaCare Health System in Appleton, Wisconsin. Under John's leadership, ThetaCare pioneered one of the most successful lean transformation efforts in recent history. Today, John helps other organizations navigate those same journeys via the ThetaCare Center for Healthcare Value, a nonprofit group. He's the author of three books. The most recent is Management on the Mend. I'm pleased to have him here today. Welcome, John. Thanks, Ted. Glad to be here with you. Yeah. So you get to travel around and see a lot of hospitals, uh, see how they're doing, and, and evaluate them on cost and quality. How are we doing as a nation? Well, we have a lot of improvement to be made. But I must say, in the last, I'd say, two or three years, we're starting to see a lot more uptake of the principles based approach to the lean journey rather than simply the tools based approach. Mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, in my travels, that there are many hospitals that are actually trying to apply the tools now of lean. But what mm -hmm. they're finding is to sustain the improvements and to build the culture, they need something else. Mm -hmm. And that's really why we've gotten into the whole management system piece, because that's what's missing in most hospitals. Yeah. But if we, if we back out a little more and, and, and look at just the current quality of our national health system mm -hmm. in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. what's, what's been happening? Do you, do you, do you see any, any, any gain? I know when we'll talk about the lean, yeah. those doing lean in, in a little bit. You know, we're still making a lot of mistakes in the industry. So we're not a high reliable industry, highly reliable industry. So, so we really need to focus on reliability. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what's missing is, you know, there was an article published uh, two years ago in the Journal of Patient Safety that showed anywhere between 240,000 and 400,000 people die in U.S. hospitals due to medical error every year. Wow. So I would say that we have a, still a significant way to go here uh, in terms of trying to, to build systems that, that create reliable outcomes for mm -hmm. patients. Is that, I mean, you were, you were a hospital CEO, so you, you know what that feels like to, to be at the helm of an organization like that. Is that what you suspect keeps most hospital CEOs up at night? I think that more and more the patient safety angle or the patient safety piece to this is, is what is really driving the change. I think there's really a couple different things happening. One is that the government is changing payment and actually reducing payment now to hospitals, so you really have to do more with less. Mm -hmm. and, and the other is this, this, this issue of, of mistakes and problems has really become you know, pretty much universally understood now. So patient safety is, uh, is becoming, you know, top of mind for, for, uh, for every, every CEO. Yeah. So the Senate, in, in the spring, the Senate passed the SG, SGR fix. Why is that so important to this framework in, in this conversation? Well, the SGR fix was was the, um, there was a bill that was passed in the 90s that had to do with physician payments and it basically cut physician payments each year for a number of years. But Congress would always repeal it every year and so this last March, in, or March 2015, they decided to actually change that and fix that, that bill. And what went into that bill some very interesting things that most people actually haven't read about in USA Today because it wasn't uh, for whatever reason big news. But it actually is big news, and there's, there's two things that I think are the biggest news about this bill that passed in March. One is it changes the payment system for physicians. Now, the ACA, Affordable Care Act, changed the payment system for hospitals. Yeah. And the SGR fix bill has actually changed the payment system for physicians. So now physicians are actually going to be rewarded to deliver better health outcomes. That's how the payment system is going to unfold over the next few years. But the other thing, and this is one of the things we worked uh, hard on at the center, was to release the Medicare data so that we could actually start to do reporting on uh, individual physician performance and actually be able to compare physicians throughout the country on cost and quality. That's a big deal, and I think we're going to start to see more of this uh, transparency 
of physician uh, performance uh, coming very soon. Yeah, and transparency is part of the Theta Care Center's mission as well is, is, is driving that, correct? Yeah, we have been involved basically in three parts of the healthcare reform activity. One is redesign of care delivery processes using lean or Toyota production system. Two is uh, transparency, so, so how do we get data out of all these data sources like Medicare, like uh, commercial claims, those kinds of things, and then build uh, reporting mechanisms so that people can understand how they're actually com comparing to their peers, and then we publicly report that so the customer, the patient, actually can see that. And then the third area that we've been working on is payment redesign itself. So we have several experiments that we're, that we're involved with to actually change from a fee-for-service payment system to a pay-for-health outcome system. Yeah. So in, in, in the, the work in that space um, with those experiments, what, give me a sample of how that's been, been working. So what we're doing at the moment is working with a employer, a large employer coalition, so a group of employers, mm -hmm. and a few providers mm -hmm. in, in a, two different markets to actually figure out how could we create a payment mechanism that would reward the doctors and the hospitals to deliver better health outcomes. So better health rather than, you know, more care. And uh, that is in, in the works as we speak. The, the other major reform initiative on payment that we've been involved in is one of the is ACOs or Accountable Care Organization programs that, that uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has been uh, directing and, and we were involved in the Pioneer program which is the first one of these payment system changes that the government has uh, uh, had uh, put together. There were 32 healthcare organizations involved in that first experiment. And what it showed is that, you know, we can significantly reduce the total cost of care and the Medicare can save tens of millions of dollars. So, so we know that, you know, there's a great opportunity and mm -hmm. now we're in the experimentation phase on these different payment systems. And, and if you look at those top performing pioneer ACOs, is there a correlation between lean and their performance? Well, the top performing one is the Bell and ThetaCare ACO, and of course, ThetaCare has been at the lean journey for a dozen years, and uh, they were able to reduce the total cost of care for 20,000 Medicare beneficiaries by 4.6 percent in one year. And so, using the principles and the process, you know, of process improvement, they were able to actually dramatically reduce the cost and improve the quality. So CMS actually um, reported the quality performance metrics last fall for all the ACOs, not just the Pioneer. And uh, the ThetaCare ACO was the number one in the country. So I think there's evidence that, you know, when you really p apply these principles, you can improve population health and you can reduce the cost of, of yeah. managing populations. That's a pretty big, uh, you know, deal because we are moving to this population health-based thinking and, and payment system. And now we're starting to see evidence that, you know, the organizations that are actually down this methodology path are the ones that are performing best. For some of our viewers that may not be familiar with that new model shift, what, explain briefly why that's so different and perhaps better than where we currently are in this fee-for-service model. In the fee-for-service model, we're basically paid to do things to people. And so when the hospital's full, we're happy as healthcare executives. Uh, when the, the more heart surgeries we do, the more heart catheterizations we do, the more we get paid. Yeah. But the data, scientific studies actually show that we overutilize in heart care, in orthopedics care. And there may be as much as 30 to 40 percent overutilization in some of these areas. So what we really need is a payment mechanism that, that, that allows us to do the right thing at the right time rather than more things at the wrong time. Yeah. And, and so that's why we need to move from this fee-for-service thing to a, a health outcomes approach, and which is more about wouldn't you rather not be in the hospital? Well, we actually can keep you out of the hospital if we have the resources designed to do that.
Yeah. You know, so from a patient perspective, I would rather be at home, you know, with, with, with home care and other services than be in the hospital. So there's a way to, for us to start to redesign services to actually deliver better health outcomes. And that's the, those are the payment mechanisms that we're experimenting with is, you know, how could we build something like that that would really reward health executives to keep people out of the hospital? Yeah. It's, it's funny, it, it, it sounds a little similar to um, some of the early stories in manufacturing when Lean was first taking hold in manufacturing in the U.S., where some organizations, people were paid based on how much stuff they made mm -hmm. versus what the customer wanted or needed. Right. And so you had these incentives in place that were driving the wrong behaviors and, and wasteful behaviors around building inventory that wasn't needed. Right. And, and <clears throat> it was, that was a real roadblock. It wasn't until you could change that until people started to think about a pulse system, for instance, based on actual demand. Right. So I think there's a lot of similarities there. Yeah. Um, we are doing unnecessary things. We have more inventory than we need. Our hospitals are, have more patients in it than, than we need to have. Yeah. And what we need to do is build a system that's patient-centered and takes the patient's needs and wants into play. And, and so right now, the way we get paid doesn't account for that. Yeah. And so we need to change that. So if you look at this uh, experimentation that ThetaCare did mm -hmm. and others like Virginia Mason mm -hmm. early on, I mean, there's clearly a growing body of evidence that this works in different health systems. Um, talk a little bit about what you see on that front. Well, we work with 60 different healthcare systems around North America now who are actually very committed to applying the, this methodology, the lean methodology, to their operations. And what we're seeing is dramatic improvements. The um, Sutter Gould, which is one of our um, uh, healthcare value network members, uh, used the, this methodology over the last four or five years to become the uh, highest rated uh, um, clinic in, in all of California for, for customer service and quality. You know, so, so we're starting to see really sort of world-class performance results yeah. um, uh, emerging from well beyond the Virginia Masons and Data Cares. The Palo Alto Medical Foundation and has done some tremendous work, you know, uh, on their patient uh, satisfaction and quality scores and they rank, you know, very high on consumer reports. We're starting to see, you know, um, uh, for example, Gunderson Lutheran, who's been using these principles for a long time in Wisconsin, I mean, they have the lowest total cost for Medicare patients in the nation. Yeah. So, you know, it, it doesn't matter where you are in the country or what kind of organization that you work for. We're seeing this happening in little rural hospitals all the way to large academic medical centers. Yeah. And these are real results. They're not, you know, trust my marketing department. They're actually third party, you know, either government uh, uh, reported results or consumer reports reported results. Yeah. Which is exciting and, and, and we've certainly seen that from where we sit. Um, I remember when we, when we started working in the healthcare space in 2006, it was very exploratory and there was a lot of um, early thinking that said, well, we're different, it can't be done here, uh, which we heard, heard, by the way, in manufacturing as well. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> some things never change, I suppose. But um, talk about how the, the center, what was the original vision for the center and how, how have you had to, what, how have you had to change its focus through the years to, to be there and help support these organizations on their journey? I started the center in, in 2008 after it became clear to me that this methodology was the, had the potential to really transform the whole industry. I mean, if we go back to the errors and, you know, that I talked about earlier, it's like, this is unacceptable. It's unacceptable that this, this industry is injuring and killing people, right? Yeah. When it's not necessary. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. So, so we need to change that. And 
And so the learnings that we got when I was CEO that, you know, we really could get to zero defects. I mean, we got to zero on several different things related to patient safety. So in 2008, I said, in, in, in the board at ThetaCare basically said, you know, you need to go spend some time with the industry and, and, and teach them what, what you've learned and, and what we continue to learn. So we started to, we started with the idea that we simply wanted to raise awareness that there was a different way to manage an organization in healthcare. And, and so we started by building a summit and, you know, where people could come and learn from each other and network about, you know, lean in healthcare. We started writing books and articles and, and you know, we built this, this network of peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning called the Healthcare Value Network. And so we really, for about five or six years, did nothing but awareness building uh, within the industry. Today, lean is part of the, you know, mainstream of healthcare. Now, I'm not saying that a lot of people know how to do it, okay, but at least the thinking is out there now and people understand that there's a different option. Yeah. Where we're moving next at the center, though, is to be more uh, specifically um, involved with the transformation process in, in organizations. So we're spending more time uh, directly coaching CEOs that want to go there uh, because, frankly, they just don't know what they don't know and they need some help. And so we have a whole team of executives now that uh, have done this and been at it for years, and we think we can help them um, accelerate their journey. And in, in this team includes other healthcare CEOs yes. as well. Yes, former CEOs or um, actually some that are still CEOs. Um, we're trying to kind of collect the best of the best that actually have the knowledge base to really help to push the industry forward faster. Yeah. Um, we see in our work, we see, we see a lot of, it, it, it really appears that lean in some form is touching probably at least half of the hospitals or perhaps a little more in this country. Um, but a lot of it still seems very tactical and tools based. And <clears throat> it's, not, it's not surprising that many are feeling like they're plateauing or they're, they're they're having to throw even more effort at it to maintain the same level of impact. And they're having trouble sustaining things. So we have our ideas on why that is, but I'd love to hear your, your ideas on, on what they're missing. I think at least in healthcare, and as the lean methodology was introduced to the industry, I think it got the reputation of simply being a series of tools and Lean does have, you know, a toolkit associated with it. But the real component of the, trans of, the, of the cultural transformation is the management system, is the leadership system, is the, the way that we act uh, and behave differently to build a culture of continuous improvement. And so what's happened is the, the leaders, the CEOs have delegated to a, you know, Lean expert to go out and do some Kaizen events and some value stream maps and then we're doing lean. And of course the reality is you can't delegate the leadership aspects of this uh, down into the organization. You have to actually be directly involved as, as the leader, as the CEO. And I think that's where we see most organizations failing is they don't really recognize that, that there's, a, there's an overall management system that's required for success, which is why the book you know, Management on the Mend was written because it's bigger than simply the, uh, a toolbox. It's, it's really about cultural change, leadership behavior change, and a management system that supports daily continuous improvement. Yeah. Diving a little deeper into that, what are those, for someone who's fairly un, uninitiated to that thinking, what are the high level hallmarks of that new management system for, for let's say, the top third of the organization? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the key principles of, of this management system is leading with humility. So what does that mean? It means, you know, you're, you don't have all the answers. You actually are trying to understand the current state background conditions before you jump to the wrong solutions. So we're actually, we need to get out to the gimba where the value is created for our patients 
and understand the barriers and problems that our frontline workers are facing. I see so many CEOs that sit in their office all day long, they don't really have a clue about their business. We need to get out and see the business. We need to get out to the emergency room and just see how long our patients are waiting or, or how many barriers our nurses have. Um, so, so that's a different behavioral um, characteristic than what we usually see in healthcare executives. You know, well that's somebody else's job. No, yeah. it's actually your job to understand the business. So that's sort of leading with the humility. Respect for people is another one of the principles. So what we're saying as the senior leader in the organization is we respect our staff members to identify and solve problems every day. So what happens usually is staff member or frontline nurse identifies a problem, ends up on the manager's desk. And sometimes the managers get to it, most of the time they don't. And because the, the manager is getting all this stuff from the top saying, do this, do this, do this, do this. When what we really need to do is shift, shift this whole thing to, you know, what do our workers need to deliver better value to our patients? And part of what they need is to be able to have the power to solve problems every day. And we haven't, you know, we haven't given them the opportunity to do that. These are all very different leadership, you know, behaviors, different leadership paradigm where, where the CEO is on the bottom and the staff members are on the top. Yeah. You know, the CEO's job is to support those staff members. Did you, were you on the other side of that line at, at one point when you were coming up? Did you have to learn, learn that? I mean, definitely, I, I, was, I, was a, I was a product of my environment. So, you know, the, the behavior modeled for me was, you know, buck stops with me, you know, blaming, controlling, you know, it's not about the process, it's about the people, all of that sort of what I call um, white coat leadership, where what we really need is improvement leadership, mentor, facilitator, teacher, coach, student. Yeah. That's how we should be acting. So it's been a huge shift for me from this really autocratic top-down world to, you know, more of, hey, wait a minute, my job is to be the support staff for my frontline teams. That's a completely different role. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of variation uh, in, in, as we work with different health systems throughout the country, I'm always shocked at how many different approaches and angles from which they're, you know, the organizations are, are trying to accomplish this work. Uh, and, but as you point out in the book, I think there's now the experiment has gone on long enough over the last 10 years where we can see some themes um, that really represent common denominators of successful transformation efforts. What are some of those, and when you're visiting a hospital, what does that look like? Uh, what's, what are some of the visual cues that you see when you're going to see? Well, I think the so, so the way I break it down is there's some really key leadership activities that are required. And so what I'm looking for is, is there standard work at the leadership level? So, you know, is there visual management at the leadership level? Do I, do I see the leaders going to the front line and actually, you know, not telling people what to do, but trying to understand where those barriers are? Um, do I see very clearly displayed True North metrics. You know, I went into a hospital the other day, they had 55 True North metrics. You know, so I said, are you absolutely sure you're going to get all 55 of those things improved this year? And of course, everybody's going, mm -hmm. So the point is, you know, can we, we have to create clarity. And so that's what I'm looking for at the leadership level. Have they created clarity? In most organizations, there is no clarity. We do not know what we should be working on. We do not know what the problems are we should be working on. There's not clarity about strategy. I was at another hospital a few, three months ago. I asked them up to identify all their strategic initiatives. They had 248 strategic initiatives. No one of the places is a disaster, yeah. right? So, so there's those kinds of things at the leadership level that we're really, that, that we're really looking for. And I, you, know, you can walk in and see that in about five minutes. But I think when we look at, so it's the leadership standard work, but then it's the leadership behaviors, right? So again, it's, it's this leading with humility. Or do, we, do we see that or not? Or is it really autocratic top-down? Um, so it's the leadership pieces. 
And then what I'm looking for is, are we actually doing model cell work? You know, because what I see again, you know, in the tool-based approach to this method, you got a gazillion things going on that aren't connected to anything. What I'm looking for now is a really inch-wide, mile-deep approach to redesigning in a radical way the work that's being done, whether that's in a clinic, whether that's in the emergency room, whether that's in the surgical suite. I want to see a radically redesigned and improved um, uh, set of processes which are delivering better value to the customer. So when you add those leadership pieces together with the model cell, and then once the model cell is created, you start spreading that, mm -hmm. that is sort of the framework for success. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's encouraging to see more of those conversations happening. We're, we're beginning to see that in our own work as well, where leaders are starting to understand that they, they may be missing that component. Right. So. I, I would say, though, that you know, one, of the, one of the problems, one of the main problems we have in the industry today is we do not have the operational expertise that's required. I mean, that's the work that you do is to try to bring operation, the, the operational expertise, mm -hmm. the lean thinkers into the, these organizations. In most cases, and ours was no different, we had no knowledge. So I really believe we need to bring, you know, that, that, that you know, what I'm recommending to uh, CEOs today is to bring somebody in that actually knows what the lean methodology is. You know, that's actually had operational experience, understands the principles, you know, and has had success. And that, that's, a, that's a really important piece here that we did too late in our journey. I think that needs to be done earlier in the journey. You're, so you're talking specifically about people perhaps from other industries where this has been road tested. It could be from other industries. Uh, you know, we have now probably 10 years of experience in healthcare, w w which we can start pulling people, yep. you know, that, that have been at this for a few years uh, that have learned. So I think it can be either. I mean, we went to industry because 12 years ago, nobody in healthcare even heard of this. So, so we had to go out to industry. And I still think that's a very reasonable play. You know, if you, again, we have to match the person to the organization yeah. culturally because manufacturing folks aren't necessarily, they don't understand healthcare culture. But if that culture thing can be matched, then I think it's, I think it's a great uh, strategy. Yeah. It's, and it's interesting, people in manufacturing now really know that there's something happening in healthcare with, with this methodology and this management system. And some are very interested. Uh, they're, they're hitting this point where in their own career they're saying, do I really want to spend the next 15 years taking seven seconds off of, uh, you know, how fast we make this widget, right. when I now know that there's a, there's a runway or a pathway to, to leverage this thinking in a way that improves care and and, and people's lives. Right, and I think you know, that's the value that an organization like yours, Styles, does is that you, know, you can match those, those people that are ready to make that leap mm -hmm. you know, to organizations that need that expertise. Yep. And we're seeing that more and more. I mean, I, I get calls regularly from people in, manu I mean, really good people in manufacturing that are saying, you know, I proved that I can do it on widgets, and I want to prove that I can actually make a difference in healthcare because, frankly, we need a lot of help. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's an exciting time for that, uh, yeah. for sure. Let's um, talk about the. You, you talk in the book quite a bit about the, the central improvement team. A couple, and, and that that's largely been our view in, in 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 work area within healthcare. Although that's changing as we do more leadership roles, but. Still, that, that central improvement team is, is the spine, if you will, um, or the, the, uh, you know, the, the pillar for a lot of this work. Why, why is it important that that report up through to the CEO versus, say, the CFO or HR? I think that there's a couple reasons why it really needs to be in the in the CEO's hands. One is, most CEOs don't know what they don't know. So they're gonna learn. 
and they need to, the, the central improvement office can be a place where they actually are learning. And, and they need to learn. I mean, I, I went into this having no knowledge. I couldn't even spell the word lean. I, you know, I'd read about Toyota production system, but I had no clue what it meant. And so I had to start from scratch, you know, and I needed coaches, and I, and I needed to understand, you know, what it was that we were actually building as a set of competencies for this team. And then I needed to be involved with the team so that it was clear to the rest of the organization that I was serious about this. That so many times, you know, we start these little projects, whatever they are, and it's like the management flavor of the day. And frankly, you know, our staff are tremendously skeptical of all of these sort of, you know, flavors of the day. They should be because most of it just flames out. If the CEO is not directly involved in building the competencies of the, in, in learning the competencies, of the central improvement office, then it's going to be considered just another management flavor of the day. And frankly, the CEO, since they're not going to train, get trained, it might be the management flavor of the day. Because after a couple of years, yeah, we did some Kaizen, we got a little improvement over here, but you know, otherwise it didn't work, so now we're done. Yeah. Well, that's because, you know, the CEO really never had a clue. Yeah. We, um, <clears throat> I like that in the book you, um, you also mention the importance of really viewing that role, uh, so a, a, you know, a, a rotational role in the, in the central improvement team is where you, if you're doing this right, and we certainly see this in manufacturing, <clears throat> that's where you're going to groom and develop your lean leaders, which is what you want. Mm -hmm. So they come in and then have a pathway out back into operations. Was that, am I characterizing that? In, in, Yes, I mean, that was what uh, my mentor, one of my mentors, uh, George Koenigsegger, who was, you know, at Jake Brake and Han and, and Deere, that's what he suggested we do. And since I didn't know any better, I did it. And uh, it, it, it worked pretty well. Yeah. But in the book, I also describe different ways of, of putting together your central office. So if you go to Health East where Didio Rubino, Rubino uh, former Anderson Windows plant manager, is working with Catherine Correa, who's the CEO there. You know, he really wants to keep that central office small and he wants to go deep with the manage managers and really make sure that they are, you know, trained uh, effectively and so he's got a team of highly qualified folks that um, are really working hand in hand with the managers to teach the principles as well as the tools, yeah. you know, that's a diff bit di of a different approach. And what I'm, what my, the points I'm making in this book are, here's the framework <clears throat> for a successful transformation. Part of that framework is a central improvement office. How you deploy and how you design that central improvement office, there's going to be some, it's going to be situational. It's going to be different based on the situation. But the key is you've got to have the core competencies there. You've got to have them in the central office so that if you choose to use that as your leadership development program, uh, fine. Or if you choose like what Health East is doing, which is to use it as kind of a deep dive training center uh, in the real work for the, for the management team, you know, that's fine. But you got to have the, the expertise because this stuff is hard. It takes time, and you've got to learn it, and you've got to have the experts helping you. Yeah. And we, we see a pattern where <clears throat> most of the successful organizations that, that we get the chance to visit are usually doing both. They have some external consultants who have a lot of expertise in this area matched up with, with an internal office and expertise. Um, and I know ThetaCare did, took a similar path. Mm -hmm. How critical is that, having that You know, it's interesting because I think uh, there are some leaders now who are actually quite knowledgeable. I mean, Catherine Correa at Health East, James Hereford at Stanford, you know, Michael Erickson at PAMP, some of these other places. In that case, you know, when the leaders really deeply understand things, I think they can go higher 
all of the internal people that they need. Mm -hmm. You know, now they may be hiring them for manufacturing, you know, they may be bringing in this, this expertise, mm -hmm. but they know enough as leaders that I'm not sure that they need those external consultants. Mm -hmm. But for the lion's share yeah. of CEOs in healthcare today, they need external help because they don't, first of all, they don't even know who to hire, <coughs> you know, internally. So, so they need that external help to help them build that um, you know, build that, um, that expertise over time, which then allows them to get rid of the external sure. uh, help. So, I mean, that should always be the goal is, you know, to build your own system so you don't need these external yeah. consultants. But for a time, uh, you know, most places are going to need external consultants. Yeah, it, it certainly seems to be the, the way you have to start. Because in the beginning, it's some of the messaging, particularly to the leadership, is probably pretty unpopular. It's hard to do that. Well, in, but the, the other inside. thing is we don't get any training in this. Yeah. We were never, I had no training in Quality Improvement 101 in, in medical school or residency. Zero. Okay? And still today, I mean, except for a few places like Michigan, University of Michigan and Stanford and a couple others, they're still not teaching this stuff. Now I think in the MHA schools, the, the, um, the, the, this is becoming more of a mainstream activity, but I think it's still pretty basic, you know, tools-based and not transformation-based yeah. thinking. So the reality is until our education system catches up to the need, we are going to need external consultants. Yeah. So this is the third book. You've, you've written, I, and I know you, you publish a lot in, in journals as well, so you're always writing, always thinking. Um, why, what did you want to accomplish with this, this book? Well, this book is written specifically for healthcare executives on the transformation journey. So this is the best thinking, and I studied 11 organizations, although I've been to 162 now. I was in my 162nd Gimba. Uh, just last week in 16 countries. So I have been really, you know, a student of the work that's going on throughout the world in, in, in this transformational activity. So this book is the compendium of the learnings from, from that, from all those years of work. And it's, it's really not a prescription, it's, it's, a, it's a guide. So what, we've, what I've written in this book are, are these are the core elements for a successful transformation. I don't tell people exactly how to do it, but what I do do them is give them different examples of how organizations have done. So we have three different uh, Lean Central Office examples in this book. You know? We have two different uh, or three different um, uh, model cell, what, what, is a, what does a model cell look like? Right, from three separate organizations, all of which have been very successful. So what we try to do is go out and find, okay, so how are people actually doing this? I mean, the ones that are thinking about it from a transformation standpoint. And that's really what the book is about, is, is what we, the best known way today. Now, I'm not saying next year I'm not going to come out with, you know, an update that an update. says, you know, hey, we missed these, these two things. But I think as, as, it, as it sits today, the, this is the best thinking for healthcare transformation from my perspective. Yeah. You've been um, such a champion of, of this movement and this thinking and this adoption of, of, of lean and the lean management system, more importantly, for several years. Um, is, are you hopeful? Where, where, where are, how are you feeling on, as, as hospitals around the country look at making this happen. Uh, are we winning? Are we gaining ground? Do you see this going someplace good? I think it's a bit too early to tell, but I do think that there are some emerging uh, really best practices throughout North America that if we continue to see that acceleration, that these places then will be acting as the, the models for the, for the nation to follow. And I think it's very interesting, you know, the secretary of the VA came out three weeks ago and basically said, we will use, you know, this is the former P&G CEO. So, I mean, P&G's been at this for a long time. So he understands operational excellence and why that's important. 
And he came out to the entire VA and to Congress and said, we're going to use a lean methodology to transform the VA to deliver better customer service for our veterans. That's kind of a big statement to make. Um, the leader at the, at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Patrick Conway, did the same thing last week. He came out in an article in Health Affairs basically saying, the lean method is how we're going to transform not only the activities in the, these uh, CMS, but the rest of the, the uh, uh, delivery system. So we're, we have leaders at very high levels in, in the United States government saying this is going to be the way we do things. And I think what we're seeing in the private sector is an, now at least an acknowledgement that we have a problem. We have to do more with less. We have to figure out, and, and you know, the acknowledgement is we've got two, two paths we can take. One is just slash and burn. Go th fire a thousand workers, half of them nurses. Do you think quality is going to improve if you go fire half your nurses? You know, so that's one way, right, to stay in business. Uh, maybe not very long. The other way is to actually, you know, uh, apply a methodology that's been shown to improve quality and lower cost and to do it every single year for the next ever, forever, right? Yeah. And, and so I, I'm optimistic that, you know, we have identified this methodology that actually can lead us to better overall health outcomes. We're starting to prove that in scientific studies. And I think that's where the industry is going to go. Um, but like I said, it's too early to tell. We have these few places that are doing great things, and uh, we need a few more before everybody gets on board. But I just don't think there's much other option. Yeah. Well, we are big fans of the work you do, and um, we're super encouraged by the path that, that is unfolding in front of us. And know that it's hard work, but you're, uh, you're really doing a great job, and we commend that. For anybody interested in reading more on these topics and in in this, this lean management system, we highly recommend this book, as well as John's other books. They can all be found on the website for the Theta Care Center for Healthcare Value. Thanks again, John. Thank you. Yeah.